I hate to start off with a protest, but I really do have to make a little protest here. Um, and that is that Gary Summers and I, uh, we agreed on this. I, uh, we asked both of us to be placed in a Christian home this year, but somehow we got the Litkeys again. Uh, and in fact, I, we wondered, we talked about it, and I said, why would they put us there again? And then I, we recognized, just really, I saw uh, immediately that it's really because of the topic about advocating godliness by your life. Because the very first night we were there, the Lickies, uh they had a knockdown, drag out fight uh, over how long it had been since they had had their last fight. <laughs> and then, in fact, I say, Joy and Gene have kind of been a big disappointment. I'm sure Gary will agree with this. And that, you know, uh, Joy is so fussy, those of us that really know her, you know, that, she, she's, that we know she'll argue about, uh, you know, anything. And again, this was maybe the second night we were there, and she looked at Gene. She said, Gene, let's not fight tonight. I feel too bad. I've got a, I've got a splitting headache. Let's wait till I get to feeling better so I can enjoy it. <laughs> so, well, uh, there's other things we've learned about the Litkeys uh, last year and this year. And uh, I did ask her, uh, why, how she was first attracted uh, to Jean. And she said, well, Terry, I noticed uh, that women loved running their fingers through Jean's hat. And, <laughs> and then she said she, she knew the guy. Jean apparently used to, I guess, wear a toupee. He, pro he probably got it late at night at a funeral home. Uh, but she, uh, Joy said she knew the guy, and I think it dated him, that borrowed Jean's hair and never returned it. And, in fact, she got, saw that he was getting all these letters from women, and she really started getting interested, she said, in him. And, uh, but she found out later that all those letters to Jean were from bald-headed women. So... No, really, I would, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't brag on Gene in defense of him. Gene has made me think, you know, of course, a lot about uh, heaven. You know, when I noticed his bald head is a lot like heaven, it's a bright and shining place, and there's no parting there. <laughs> so they do, have their, they do have their spiritual, you know, good points. Seriously, uh, <clears throat> seriously, we can say... Uh, both Gary and myself, that we've been staying, like I've been telling them, at the Taj Mahal of Holiday Inns. That's what I've dubbed their house, you know. So, uh, And with a built-in maid, built-in cook, and wow, I couldn't stay much longer, or uh, Gary or me, I think, or we would really uh, be gaining some weight. We're going to have to exercise off. Just one, one more thing but before I go to my lesson, and that is Bruce Stulting. I mean... You know, when should we pray? And, and Bruce, you said, when should we pray? And you said, this is the quote right out of the book and from his own mouth. The Christian must pray when he is alone or with someone. <laughs> now, buddy, that may be one of those uh, deeper things, I guess, or a profound nugget from the scriptures. Uh, we, some, of us, some of us drove miles to get here to hear such profound nuggets as that. So, wow. Well, the, fa the thing is, I wanted to ask him, though, did you figure that out all by yourself? Or, or did Sue really help you? Well, no, it's great to... <clears throat> I mentioned at the beginning of my chapter, uh, I once opened my, up my newspaper to an article which reported on the arrest of a young man for drug trafficking. And he protested concerning his, quote, religiosity, end quote, to the civil authorities there that, of course, had arrested him by declaring something along this line. He said, I want you to know, he said, I want you to know, he's telling the officers this, I want you to know uh, I don't use them. In other words, the drugs that he's trafficking, trafficking in. He said, I don't use them. I just sell them. I'm a good Christian. 
Well, immediately you know there's something wrong with that situation. I'm sure the police officers were very impressed. The scriptures tell us an entirely different story as to the reality of God's impression of this individual who enabled others, don't you see, to sin by proxy through the actions of another. And sometimes we can maybe uh, be pretty subtle uh, with how we uh, go about uh, doing that. I wanted to read a statement here, and I believe that I could agree with it. I was, when I was, before I was baptized at age 13, I knew for at least, I'd say, two years what I needed to do as far as what the Bible taught. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm listening. I started picking up from the preacher and my Bible class teachers that, that uh, if I believed what I was supposed to believe uh, and from this book, it would make a difference in how I lived. You know, I picked that up from the preacher and the Bible class teachers. Uh, some liberals in the church like to go back and tell how bad it was and that we didn't talk about uh, the Christian life in our behavior and so forth. All you had to have was your doctrine, you know, right, and then you could sort of live the way you wanted to. That's not what I heard. Did any of you hear that? In fact, I haven't run into a, a brother who, or a sister who would really uh, claim that. The fact is that the issue for me was never really whether the Christian teachings, you know, could, were true and could be understood. Uh, I had no doubt that the, that was the case. But instead, the issue really came down to, at least before I was baptized, uh, would I be willing to live by the demands of Christian teaching? That's really what the real issue was, I think, with maybe perhaps uh, you and many others in here, perhaps all of us. In a survey at Michigan State University, this is not in the book, uh, in a survey at Michigan State University, students were asked, do you believe there is a God? And they had a big G and a little g, both, both of them. Uh, and if so, do you think that this, uh, what do you think this God is like? And here's what one student at uh, Michigan State University answered. He said, God is everything. God is everything each person thinks of him or her. Uh, another student at Haverford College in a similar survey said this, God exists in each individual, and the form uh, which their God takes is entirely up to them. To say there is one God or dictate a God or concept of God to someone other than yourself is denying them, he said, the chance to experience God for themselves, and therefore I think it is unfair. Yes, God exists, he said, but to each his slash her own. But to each his or her own. Of course, a such a God becomes really, don't you see, merely a psychological uh, category, I guess, or a subject of one's own personality will absolutely no objective reference whatsoever. So, you know, when we make up our God, as he, this student suggested, this young man suggested, what does he look like? At least 40 students at Michigan State limited their description of God solely to those aspects, now watch this, highly favorable to us. God is said to be, you know, and this was in the survey, God is said to be all love, flexible and understanding, all forgiving, a very kind man, a good spirit, nice, and so on. And missing here, of course, was any sense of a God who might be holy and righteous, or who might call his creatures to be uh, holy and, and righteous and so forth, or to hold them responsible for their actions, for their deeds. God is rather, in that view, don't you see, he's just really boils down to what I would call a cosmic grandfather, the, the wimpy God of convenience to me. Uh, let's just go ahead and say this. He's the mush God. He's the mush God. That, that's all that amounts to. And these students might, have all have, might all have prefaced their comments as one student actually did. I like to, th I like to, I like to think of God as 
See, you just fill her in any way you want. There's no real demands there. Surely if there is a deity worthy of deity, then he, she, it, like they're doing, you see, it's actually a he, isn't it? Uh, it will not just be what we think uh, of that deity, uh, but what we like to think of God is obviously going to turn into just much more likely to, to become a pure figment of our imagination, and that's what we see in the world, don't we? That's from a book, by the way, uh, Why Should Anyone Believe Anything at All by James Sire. Uh, it's, it's the situation where uh, you cannot simply look at it like, well, I'm a good Christian, you know, I'm a religious person, I'm a follower of God, Christ, and the Bible, and so forth, uh, and yet, yeah, my behavior hasn't really caught up, you know, with my doctrine or anything yet. But see, it really doesn't have to, because God is this wimpy con God of convenience, and he'll sort of adapt himself to me. I've often taken my New Testament and preaching sometimes, and I'll say, you know, here you are as a human, and here's God's word, and it's not going to be the case that he fits it around you to keep you happy. You have to comply with this. We are under, in effect, this book. And that's how Jesus, of course, speaks to us uh, today. He's not speaking uh, directly, and I'll deal with that in just a minute. But uh, the Scriptures teach, like in Acts 3, verses 14 and 15, you'll notice, but ye denied, uh, speaking to Jews, but they didn't literally kill Jesus, did they? He said, but ye denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted unto you and kill the prince of life, whom God, uh, whom God raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. He goes on to say, ye by the hand of lawless men. He's speaking of the Romans who they did it by proxy through. Uh, ye by the hand of lawless men did crucify and slay. In Acts 2.23. Uh, we know that Eve gave also to her husband with her, and, and he did eat in Genesis 3.6. It says in 2 Chronicles 33.9, So Manasseh made, notice that word, made Judah and the inhabitants to err, and to do worse than the heathen, to do worse than the heathen, uh, whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Well, God being who he really is, he's not going to have just a favorite people and just ignore then their wrongdoing. In fact, as we know from Peter and other uh, writers, of, of by inspiration, they tell us you're going to be in, as some speakers have already pointed out in this lectureship, you'll be in worse shape than if you never obeyed the gospel at all. When you turn back from the gospel and you're not living, I would stress for my lesson, you're not living the Christian life, you're not really advocating by your life and teaching, uh, you know, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone around you. Well, again, I gave some lists of scriptures in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, and also Galatians 5, 19 through 24, that I'm sure that you are familiar with. And you immediately see that you've got to be having the gospel internally inside you and it be changing you and, and how you live. You cannot just do a verbal gospel, I would call it. Uh, and that, of course, would even include bad language and so forth. It still amazes me that we have many Christians and many of young people who are Christians, certainly, that I've noticed in, uh, even in my home congregation now who are very prone to say, uh, O-M-G, only they say the words to that. Now, I'm telling you, if when you study the Bible, you better start looking at that. And could it just be that the Bible would be teaching that you're actually taking God's name in vain when you do that? But it's just, no, nah, but they hear it at school all the time. I hear it at the school where I substitute teach uh, all the time. But that's at least it is out of people who aren't even professing, usually Christ, but then sometimes I'll hear them say, yeah, you know, he'll, they'll say something about themselves being a follower of God and Christ and going to a chapel period and things like that. Oh, well, should they talk like that? Now, let me address something a little bit different here. This is in the, also in the chapter. But despite the MacDever theory of the Holy Spirit uh, help or direct help, you know, whereby, whereby the Holy Spirit is supposedly acts directly upon our minds today, the scriptures teach that uh, he helps indirectly. 
Are we denying the Holy Spirit's help? Certainly not. I believe in divine providence. I've given lectures on that, uh, some of which are in the Denton, uh, one, particularly one or two in the, at the Denton lectures. But he helps indirectly, not directly, so, and, and because we want to preserve uh, the human, uh, the human uh, person's integrity and, in, and accountability for keeping ourselves. And I mean by that uh, such verses as 1 John 5 and verse 18. Turn and look at that. 1 John 5 and verse 18. We must keep ourselves. If you're a lady, you must keep yourself in the sense of keeping herself then in moral actions. And this verse says, We know that whosoever is begotten of God sinneth not, but not on a regular basis anyway, uh, but he is not a practice of a, of a faithful Christian, but he that was begotten of God keepeth himself, keepeth himself, and the evil one toucheth him not. And then in James 1.27, the last part of it, And to keep oneself, you remember this, unspotted from the world. That puts the onus on each one of us as individuals. And you ought not to ever look at it as Mac and others are teaching or trying to uh, uh, teach out here. And that uh, the Holy Spirit will really take up my slack in moral actions so that when I'm at a, in a weak situation or I don't have enough courage to speak the gospel, he, the Holy Spirit directly will affect my mind and, and make up that slack and cause me to be able to complete this action. Now, you try to find that, though, uh, in Scripture. It's not there. In fact, it's being refuted in 1 John 5.18 and verses like James 1.27. Uh, Notice the 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. Paul makes it clear to the church at Corinth. He says, For we must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he hath done. Not what the Holy Spirit's done for me in a direct action on my mind, but he says according to what he, the human, you see, each one of us as accountable moral beings before God uh, have done, whether it be good or bad. You might, I'm just saying, this section here, right here, you might uh, want to call this a handy-dandy diva refuter. That's what this is. Although at times I could have wished I actually had a direct operation of the Spirit, if the motion of my personal will is aided, don't you see, by an interior impulse direct from the Holy Spirit, then the fact is that I did not complete the moral action of my moral will, the Spirit did. Does everybody see that? And that takes the ground out uh, from under all of this theorizing that some of our own brethren, some of which, like Mac, that I went to school with and studied under Brother Warren. Uh, I was unable to, to accomplish in that situation, don't you see, my own personal, what I'll call inside ethics, and folks, that's what you've got to have to go to heaven. Uh, to be a faithful Christian, you've got to have inside ethics. It can't be uh, mama's ethics or daddy's ethics. Oh, they can help influence you and certainly ought to. Must do that. But it's still like it's, it, I reached the age of age 13 and I realized I was in sin and I needed to obey the gospel for me. Not to make my mother happy, not to make my grandparents happy. My one on one side was a gospel preacher. Uh, it wasn't uh, for that, you see, at all. I needed to have inside ethics and obey the gospel for me in order to be saved and have my sins, uh, personal sins, remitted. Uh, so, again, I, I was unable to accomplish, given the situation I've talked about, uh, where the Holy Spirit's directly operating on my mind, uh, this personal, my own personal inside ethics, because such change the required, and there from 2 Corinthians 5.10, uh, one into two, from he uh, hath done to he, that's me, and he, big H, Holy Spirit, hath done. Now, uh, what is amazing about Mac's passive sanctification theory, and that's exactly what it is, a passive th sanctification theory is that he maintains the word of God coupled with an honest, obedient heart in an alien sinner is competent 
to moderate or to control the passions. But it's not, for some reason, it is not competent to do so for the uh, Christian with the same uh, basic obedient heart. I'm sorry, but I fail to see how true virtue could be gained by any human in resisting temptation when, in fact, the Holy Spirit gave us the, the direct strength to resist, uh, which we did not possess on our own. Uh, and, and just merely saying, oh, well, uh, uh, sometimes they'll, uh, Mac has made certain statements and other brethren you know, with him about this, but surely you can see this and just say, well, it's harder, Mac says, to uh, remain a Christian than it is to become one. I've always wanted to ask and have Roy Deaver, his father, uh, you know, to be sitting here and say, Roy, tell us about that African uh, who has seven wives and he has, as he said, issue from all those wives. Oh, it'll be easy for him to obey the gospel, won't it? But you know what he has to do. How many wives can he have? Can he keep the, you know, the same home situation with all seven? No. You'd have to go back to the original, the first one, of which God joined him together with her. And the gospel required him to get out of that. And I can give you hundreds of scenarios about an alien sinner and what they have to do. You might be the only teenager in, in your, uh, in, out of your whole family, and you may be a teenager who obeys the gospel. And I've seen pressure, tremendous pressure put on uh, young people to not obey the gospel, even though they knew that's what the Bible taught. And some then even were talked into falling away and going back to a human denomination. Oh, but it's easier uh, to become a Christian than it is to remain one. No, it's not. Every situation is different. And that can be a really tough, tough situation. In order to obey the gospel, you may be even risking your life and, and your head uh, being taken off of your shoulder by a blade of some sort if you obey the gospel. There's plenty of Muslims around who would be happy to accommodate you on some of those matters. And, and yet, oh, it's easier. No, basic morality is basic morality, whether you're a, uh, an alien sinner or whether you uh, are a Christian. Uh, another thing about this, of course, it, we could also put in, and I have in other materials, and that is that here's a, uh, a young person who's, who's not reached the age of accountability yet. Can the Bible help them? They have no Holy Spirit in them in the sense of Acts 2.38 and other verses. So what's that situation? Uh, and that's never uh, been answered, although it's been asked numerous times. Well, again, uh, I would just say, uh, what about the, if you look, turn and look at 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 8, what about this common sense principle here by Paul once again, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 8, of each shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Not the labor of the Holy Spirit directly, like is it my direct will and then his direct will. No. Uh, each shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, if sanctification is passive, like some of these brethren are really teaching, uh, a view that's represented by the well-known slogan out here among denominational preachers of let go and let God. I can just hear old Robert saying that and others. Let go and let God. It's like put your mind out of gear. Put it in. New no, that's not the case. You remember in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21? Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. That's right off the title that I was assigned by David about this uh, lesson. That we must advocate to remain a faithful Christian, you or myself, we must advocate godliness by our lives and, our, and, and teaching, expose and refute any, everything to the contrary, and then he uh, signed this, prove all things holding fast to that which is good. Unless you can prove it and show you have God's authority for it, then you can't really tr uh, truthfully say and honestly say it's good. You don't know that. You're back like those Michigan State students. And they can just write their own uh, morality, don't you see, with that view that they have of who God is. That's not the God of this book. That's not the God of the Bible. And he's never said just let go and let God. <clears throat> How would we understand such apostolic statements uh, as in 1 Corinthians 9.26 or 2 Timothy uh, uh, 4 verse 7? 
I fight. I run the race. I have to make my own fight here. Again, mom and dad can't do it for me. Uh, my wife cannot do it for me. My children can't. I can't do it for them. It's I fight. I run. I buffet, as we say in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, as Paul said, I buffet my body and bring it into bondage. And if you're sitting around waiting, thinking the Holy Spirit's going to step in like Mac and others have said, you're just simply mistaken about it, just like he is. Uh, uh, let, us, let us cleanse ourselves. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Uh, how about Hebrews 12, verse 1. Uh, Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Who's got to lay the weight aside? Who's got to get rid of these things that are impinging on our Christianity, on our behavior? We've got to do it. Now, will God help us? Yes. But it's indirect help. It's divine providence. And I can give all kinds of preached sermons over the years on how God will help you. But he's not going to step in and do it directly uh, for you. According to Mac, if my self, put a big S on self, if my self is active to a certain point of moral action X, Y, Z, whatever, however you want to look at that, but then I become passive due to my own lack of strength needed to accomplish it, then the Spirit will actively step in to move my will in completing the action. Believe it, who can? Well, a Terry Powell is an individual, uh, and I'll document where this came from. He addresses this ethical foolishness. And he says, and this is the best I could come up with. This was supposed to end up being a tennis racket. But Jody said that, uh, you know, that David can't handle that anymore. And he has to have something, you know, lighter. She said the grandkids beat him all the time anyway. But I think this one looks like maybe he sort of hung it up looking at the, the condition of this. But I want you to imagine this as a tennis racket and listen to what this Terry Powell said. He said, I once saw a TV ad produced by a sporting goods manufacturer. The company was touting a tennis racket that Jimmy Connors had used in the prestigious Wimbledon tournament. The ad showed Connors zigzagging all over the court, slapping the tennis ball across the net toward a befuddled opponent. Then an announcer's voice boasted, Our racket won Wimbledon. Our racket won Wimbledon? Uh, when you stop and think about it, uh, Powell says, that was a pompous and ridiculous claim. He said, I thought all along that Jimmy Connors had won the tournament. Uh, I never heard of a tennis racket that had its own trophy room. And here's the crunch. Who deserved the sports accolades, Jimmy Connors or the tennis racket? Well, there it is. Uh, and Devers concocted, and the Devers concocted theory. This includes Whalen and did include Todd. I'm not too sure about him. He must have gotten a direct operation to go a different way. Uh, but in Deaver's concocted theory here, virtue as self-action has been changed into spirit action, or what I just say is moral infusion. It might as well be, and it's, which is even better than Roman Catholic indulgences. You remember old John Tetzel back there years ago debating, you know, Luther, and Luther was upset over this. It was one of his 95 theses that he nailed to the door of the Wittenberg, uh, Germany church uh, building. They were debate propositions, by the way. And, uh, but John Tetzel had been going all over the country fleecing these Catholics out of money about in the sale of indulgences with the little phrase or little uh, thing for these very limited education-wise, anyway, persons. And he said, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Well, you can move grandma. Uh-oh, I'm not supposed to mention grandma, am I? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh... The, you're not, you're, the fact is, if I want to move Grandma out of purgatory and get her to go on into pure or straight heaven, I can move her up the purgatorial ladder, see, by paying money down here to John Tetzel, this priest, or to the Roman Catholics. And, of course, you, you can't find it in the Bible anywhere. It's not there. Oh, they've got a few verses they'll cite to you sometimes when they're really pushed on it. But it's not there. You know, your time spent in purgatory... 
uh, you know, can be shortened. You can even pay, apparently, for yourself ahead of time and get moved up the ladder. Now, let, let me just ask you this question. True or false, a voluntary action proceeds from a person's own power. What did I say? A voluntary action uh, proceeds from a person's own power within, not from a direct activity upon his mind by another. I say it's true. I say that's true. What do you hold? One can also see the basic principle. Can't you see it? Uh, uh, carried over into Mormon theology and that they maintain that a living person can be baptized by proxy. On They can do the, the basic moral action then, don't you see, for someone on behalf of a dead person. And they get that, of course, falsely. Uh, they try to get it from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 29 and 30. But supposedly that will count with God just as if the deceased individual did it for himself. Uh, I'm, just sure, uh, I'm just sure that the will of the dead person is more than happy to have someone here on earth, don't you, to complete his obedience for him, perhaps even more given his location as described in Luke 16, verse 23, uh, than, than Max delight in the Holy Spirit repeatedly completing his. The fact is, God's word, coupled with a good and honest heart, is sufficient uh, to accomplish the salvation of both alien sinner and saint in the same way just as Scripture uh, teaches us. We have cited, and I want you to look at Acts 20 and verse 32. And I want you to really think about this. Uh, there have been various attempts to get around this verse, but you really can't do it uh, ethically or really even coming into it almost from a philosophical basis, you can't do it. But Acts 20 and verse 32, uh, Luke writes, and of course it reports this, as in, and now, and this is, he's recording what Paul is saying to these elders, he says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all them that are sanctified. He didn't say that you should depend, and it's nowhere in Scripture to depend on a direct operation of the Holy Spirit to make you where you do the right thing. You've got to do it, don't you see, uh, for yourself. And so again, uh, it's just the fact that the alien sinner or the Christian, it's an equal thing. Acts 10 and verse 34, which says that God is no respecter of persons. And immediately some of these brethren jump up and say, Terry, are you saying that God cannot do something uh, for the Christian that he doesn't do for the non-Christian? No, but I'm, I would turn in turn ask you, what does Acts 10, 34 mean? Is there anything in morality, for instance, like some of you have actually debated on in this group, like Mac, about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and he says that the alien sinner is under Matthew 19, 9 and Matthew 5, 32, just like the Christian is. What about stealing? What about rape? What about murder? And so is, is there going to be a two-graded two system here for that uh, about an alien sinner as versus a Christian? The fact is, all of that, what you must see here, this is to ignore the basis of human, human accountability, and, and it set forth, in effect, two sets of morality, one for this Christian one for the saint, and one uh, another for a non-Christian. Well, it won't work. Uh, the fact is, you must do it. And it's just foolish to take that view as to end up saying, well, it really wasn't, you know, Jimmy Connor there. It was the racket that that year won Wimbledon. Oh, did it have something to do with it? Yeah. But uh, it was Jimmy who actually had uh, the racket in his hand and he used it uh, as a tool, and then he had to do the winning of the tennis match himself. So would you agree or disagree with this, uh, the, this statement? In the final analysis, uh, and we're changing gears a little bit here, sound doctrine, uh, sound doctrine uh, without its necessary complement of personal ethics is as unbiblical as its liberal alternative of, in other words, personal ethics, without doctrine. And I would say I agree with that. Uh, and this is coming from some uh, people uh, who are not even members of the church, and they see, of course, this clear truth from Scripture. 
whereas the fundamental error of liberalism lies in its feeble and foolish attempt to retain biblical ethics without its foundation in Christian doctrine, in other words, the Bible and Scripture, the basic error sometimes maybe of some conservatives to think that we can remain faithful to Christ without personally appropriating to ourselves the teachings of the Word of God. And I suppose if we look around a congregation, we can sometimes see those who seem to be attempting that viewpoint. They say, well, I've got my doctrine straight. I'm a member of the Lord's Church. I know what the Scripture says about the work, the organization, and so forth of the church. Uh, but yet, in their personal life, they seem to forget that they must comply and live the Christian life before their fellow man. They must do it. It brings to mind Jesus' statement concerning the scribes and the Pharisees. He said on one occasion there in Matthew 23, verses 1, 2, and 3, he said, The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. All things, therefore, whatsoever they bid you, in other words, when telling you the truth from God's uh, word, from his divinely inspired word, then these do and observe. But he said, but do not ye after their works. Watch it now, Christian. For they say and do not. They're more than willing to put these heavy certain burdens and obligations on all these other people. But they're unwilling to live it and to do it themselves. Uh, let me just, I'm going to have to end here. But... Uh, the following story reminded me of some of my beloved brethren about this, of this. And sometimes myself said a couple was invited to dinner by their elderly neighbors. And the old gentleman endearingly preceded, preceded every request to his wife with terms of endearment. You know, honey and darling and sweetheart and pumpkin and so on. The neighbors were impressed since the couple had been married almost 70 years. And while the wife was off in the kitchen... The neighbor said to the, to the gentleman, I think it's wonderful that after all these years you've been married, you still refer to your wife in those terms. The elderly husband just hung his head and he said, Actually, I forgot the old lady's name about ten years ago. <laughs> well, I say that to say, have you forgotten the call of holy living? It's there. We list verses for you. I won't take time to cite all of them. Both the Old and the New Testament. There's the call to holy living and you and myself personally living it. Now, while this elderly man might not lose his soul over forgetting old what's-her-name, uh, and maybe even not for, making, uh, for not making the time and effort to find out what old what's-her-name's real name really is, uh, you... Or myself, we can lose our souls by failing to obey what the scriptures teach about this. That Christians must what? Put away as concerning your former manner of life the old man. Uh, Paul said this in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. That waxeth corrupt after the lust of deceit, and that ye be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man that after uh, God hath been created uh, in righteousness and holiness of truth. The Bible makes it crystal clear that we must not only uphold Christianity in theory uh, as to the correct or right itemized doctrinal principles and specifics like in Jude 3 to contend earnestly for the faith, but we must always remember that personal practice of godliness counts uh, with God, and we must do it. And uh, we've given verses there that we hope you'll go on uh, and read. Certain verses just sort of, I say about myself, just hit you right square between the eyes about uh, what we must do. We must have, in our behavior, we must demonstrate Christ living, you know, in uh, us. And uh, I will close with this one, and I'll see if you relate to this. It says, a troubled follower of Christ had reached the end of her rope concerning her relationship with her husband. So she went to see the preacher for counsel. Uh, she informed him of the numerous ways she had attempted to change her spouse's attitude and behavior. You see, not herself, but him. Uh, mostly by nagging him and responding in kind to his evil ways. And right then, the preacher thought of Paul's admonitions of overcoming evil uh, with good in Romans 12, uh, verses 14 through 21. Especially verse 20, verse 20, But if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him to drink. For in so doing, thou shalt 
He calls a fire upon his head. So the preacher just asked her, Sister Scott, have you ever tried heaping coals of fire on your husband's head? And she answered, well, no, I haven't. But one time I did pour a skillet of hot gravy on him during dinner. Well, <laughs> the fact is you cannot operate one way. And, and as we've often pointed out to a sister in Christ or a brother in Christ the other way around, if you're not living it, you know, don't think you're going to convert this person. And they are watching. Someone's already told a story about that. And watching the thing about taking, you know, parts off the car, taking the wheels off. And so and they're watching it. Remember, I think it was stated. If she had uh, bowed and had gone the wrong way, just one time, he said, it like he would not have become a Christian. He would not have operated like he did. So tell me, are you overcoming evil with good in your personal life before others? Uh, by means of the Holy Spirit, uh, direct operation in the mind of Paul, this is a command over and over again, not a mere uh, suggestion. So we would close then and uh, would point out to you uh, that you, if you need to obey the gospel to be baptized into Christ, we would urge that you do that. You have to start to, uh, on the road of Christianity, first of all, by putting Christ on uh, in baptism. Once you do that, uh, after having believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, after having repented of any sins you have any knowledge of, you won't even know about all of them yet, but you'll find out more about it than when you study the book further. Uh, and then confess Christ that he is the Son of God uh, and therefore uh, place your allegiance with him as over against people who are here uh, in the world. We know that uh, we must ask ourselves constantly, and I'm asking you this afternoon, are you faithful? Are you faithful? That's what this whole lectureship has been about and is about. A couple, a couple more speeches to go. Uh, are you faithful? If not, won't you repent, brother or sister in Christ, and, and come back? Uh, begin again. And please do not excuse your silence and your failure to speak up and be willing as Lynn Parker pointed out so well uh, yesterday, uh, to teach the gospel to others, to have contact with others. Please do not excuse your silence. Uh, you wouldn't have this assignment from God unless you could accomplish it, unless you could somehow teach someone uh, the gospel. Now, I use uh, the illustration. The way we drive our cars is, is really a good analogy, I think, especially before we had the luxury of power steering. When the car is standing still, uh, turning the steering wheel, can be done only with greater difficulty and with less effectiveness. But when the car is moving, it's, all, it's moving, you see, then it's a different story. A slight turn of the, of the wheel then will send the car in a different direction, and, and it's a much smoother, easier situation. But if you're still just sitting there, and, oh, well, one day I'll obey the gospel. Oh, one day I'll come back. Yeah, sure. Uh, why I say that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Why not just go ahead and respond to the gospel this afternoon? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you would be uh, be much happier as you drive home, knowing that you're back in the harness for Jesus Christ and His church. It gets easier and more exciting after the first time that you see some souls here, precious souls, baptized into Christ and added to the church. Won't you respond <clears throat> right now as we stand and as we sing?